So here's something your doctor might not be telling you about your osteoporosis drugs. Osteonecrosis of the jaw, a potentially debilitating condition, can be a risk of especially the anti-resorptive osteoporosis drugs. Now, maybe you've actually heard of osteonecrosis of the jaw because it's definitely out there in Facebook, on social media, but you've been told not to worry because it's really rare. But what if I told you the real numbers are actually a lot higher than we previously thought and they've been hiding in pretty much plain sight? See, there's a new study from Finland that's really pulling the curtain back on what these numbers really are in a country that has better reporting of this type of data, and I'll explain that. But we're going to talk about in this video what this means for anyone taking or considering taking these drugs, which are Prolia, Denosumab, Fosamax, Alendronic, Reclast, and on and on. All of the Prolia or bisphosphonate drugs are considered anti-resorptive drugs. So let me just take a minute to explain sort of what osteonecrosis of the jaw is and what the terminology really is here. So what we're talking about is medication-related osteonecrosis of the jaw or bone death of the jaw bone itself. So this is actually called M-R-O-N-J, not just O-N-J. Um, and it's medication-related, meaning that this comes from likely the medications that a patient is on at the time they experience this. And this isn't just an important clinical diagnosis. This is actually a massively important for your health span, for your lifespan diagnosis, something that we really want to avoid because it can absolutely be devastating. What we're talking about, and I apologize for getting really grotesque here, but what we're talking about is open exposed bone, meaning bone that is open to the outside world that refuses to heal, infections that can recur again and again, requiring chronic antibiotics, pain that can become constant. People often have to go through multiple surgeries, many times failed surgeries, in extreme cases, even have segments of their jawbone removed. This isn't just about chewing or talking or looking nice. It's about losing the ability to actually eat normally, to smile confidently or speak clearly. It actually erodes physical function and social connections all at once. This is a really big deal. And the consequences really ripple out from there. As nutritional status declines, other bad things happen, of course, including osteoporosis. Chronic inflammation will set in because of a chronic infection. Hospitalizations become more frequent. For older adults already battling frailty, muscle loss, and other comorbidities, osteonecrosis of the jaw can lead to a cascade of events that accelerate aging and ultimately end in death. Again, this is a big deal. And this condition is not just localized. It's not just dental. It's systemic. And when it happens, it threatens everything that we're working so hard to preserve from our bone health to our muscle mass to our mobility, independence, dignity, and lifespan. So the question then is, is this actually really rare? Because if you ask most doctors that prescribe these drugs, they'll say, yes, this is a real thing. However, if you look at the studies, it was, you know, one, two, or four out of 10,000 patients or patient years. Those numbers are what was originally reported. But now we have additional data that I want to go through with you. So how common is it really? So let's talk about this study. So this was a study that had over 58,000 participants. These are adults who had been prescribed an anti-resorptive medication over an eight-year period of time. These were drugs, again, like oral bisphosphonates, IV bisphosphonates, both low and high dose prolia. And I'm going to talk to you about uh, what the differences are between those two so you know which one you're taking. But here's what they found. For low-dose bisphosphonates, the rate of osteonecrosis from medications of the jaw was still under 1%. In fact, it was listed as 0.14%, which is still actually pretty rare. Now, higher dose bisphosphonates, which are going to be used in a different circumstance, which we'll talk about, that was much more than 1%. This was 2.6%. So that no longer meets the criteria of really rare. Now, the low dose denosumab or prolia, uh, as it's known in the US, low dose, which is the normal dose, we'll talk about this, was a little over 1%, which is much higher than was previously reported. And then the higher dose and more frequent dosing, which you would see in the drug Exgiva, this is used in um, uh, cancer treatment to preserve bone and reduce musculoskeletal complications of metastatic disease. Um, but this number was really high, 11.4%. So really having an impact on the bone. 
So let's talk a little bit about what low dose, high dose means, because this could get really scary, right? 10% or more is absolutely frightening. So when we talk about low dose bisphosphonates, we're talking about things like Fosamax, right? 70 milligrams once weekly Fosamax. Um, Actinel, 35 milligrams uh, weekly or 150 milligrams monthly. You know, this is the type of low dose, usual osteoporosis type of drug. And then from an IV bisphosphonate perspective, we're talking about zolandronic acid or reclass in the US, and that's five milligrams done through an IV once a year. And that's in contrast to the high dose bisphosphonates. So for high dose, we're usually talking about zolandronic acid, same thing as reclassed, but in the form of Zometa in the US, and this is four milligrams every three to four weeks. So much more frequent dosing. Now, when it comes to Prolia, Generally, most people are getting 60 milligrams every six months, right? This is a sub-Q injection. Generally get done in an infusion center at your doctor's office, 60 milligrams every six months. This is quote unquote low dose or primary prevention um, prolia. Now there's also a high dose denosumab or exgeva, and that's 120 milligrams. So twice the dose, and that's done every month. And again, this is for metastatic disease or multiple myeloma. Now, here's an important point, though. They also noticed that those that were on some kind of a steroid, they didn't really get into like the duration or the type, but those that had exposure to corticosteroids, oral or inhaled or IV steroids, there was an additional risk amplifier. Now, they actually put a number on this of up to six times the numbers that I mentioned earlier. So if you go back and you say low dose bisphosphonate 0.14, okay, multiply that times six. Now, obviously, we're at the 1% mark. If you look at the, you know, higher dose bisphosphonates, if you look at Prolia, you know, there was over 1% already. Now we're talking about up to 6x that. Now we're talking about 6%. So these are still low numbers, but now these are no longer rare. These are actually very significant and something that we should be considering because a lot of times people are actually put on these anti-resorptive drugs because they are on steroids. And they're probably not being told about this risk because this really hasn't been clearly defined in previous studies. So I want to just take a moment and actually go back in time a little bit and talk about some of the other studies that we've talked about in the past. So if you look at the Freedom Study, which is the, the long study for Prolia, where we have the most data and also the follow-up data, what they reported on osteonecrosis of the jaw was 0.04%. And I already just said in this study, it was over 1%. Now for reclass and other IV bisphosphonates, some of the data would show it kind of hovers around 1% to 2%, again, about half of what we see in this study. Oral bisphosphonates are, are frequently cited to be provoking osteonecrosis of the jaw around 0.1%. So that is actually more in line with what we see in the finished study, but there is still something else to talk about here, which is reporting. Because in the United States versus other areas around the globe that have more sophisticated reporting systems, there is a challenge around understanding what happens with these medication side effects. So let's talk about the U.S. first. So in the United States, we have a voluntary reporting system for most adverse drug events. So for medications like Perlia or Reclass, the FDA uses the system called FAERS or F-A-E-R-S. That's the FDA Adverse Event Reporting System. But unlike clinical trials where everything is tracked and everything's reported, the real world pharmacovigilance in the U.S. is passive, meaning that physicians, pharmacists, and even patients can submit reports, but they're not required to. And it's kind of a complex process to. Unfortunately, that's a recipe for underreporting. And this isn't a new challenge because this approach has been the approach that's been used for as long as I have been in the medical space. Now, during the pandemic, we actually saw some controversy around this, right? So the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, or VAERS, came under heavy scrutiny. And it didn't matter on which side of the you know benefit or risk that you were concerned about with vaccines. On one hand, critics argued that it that VAERS underreported serious events because filing was cumbersome and discouraged. But on the other hand, some people on the other side of that coin claimed that it overreported because anyone could file a report without proof. So the truth is, both criticisms point to the same reality, which is that VAERS, like FAERS, is only as good as the data it receives. And the data is obviously going to be incomplete because who knows how to do this? Why would they do it? What's the motivation? 
So then let's look at other countries like Finland. So in Finland, there's a much more sophisticated reporting system. It relies less on voluntary reporting and more about observation and generating uh, data on safety trends for everything that's being prescribed. So without that type of system, the safety trends in the U.S. are very hard to detect. But that's actually not even the meat of it. The biggest issue when it comes around osteonecrosis of the jaw is actually the fact that we're talking about two different medical specialties. We have the entire medical system, uh, which can include some dental work, but usually we have the American Dental Association. We have dentists, which are not usually medical doctors, and it's a completely different system. This is another reason why this is likely underreported in the United States. So what do I mean? Well, by definition, medication-related osteonecrosis of the jaw is a dental diagnosis. And many medical providers will actually never see it, even if their patient ends up having this issue. So we as medical doctors might prescribe the drugs, but we're not the ones who are out there doing the extraction, the implants, or managing exposed jawbone. You see, dentists will see it, and many of them have been telling us for years that osteonecrosis of the jaw is more common than the literature suggests, and many doctors should chalk this up to bias. They're working with people that have dental problems. But they don't really have a good place to report it. Of course, they can still report it to the same place that we can, but there isn't really a centralized dental medical reporting system in the U.S., and that means that cases are going to fall through the cracks. To make matters worse, one of the biggest risk factors is already having dental issues. And guess what? It's extremely common as we age to need dental work. Gum disease, tooth loss, cavities, root canals that are chronically infected, etc. The very population that needs the osteoporosis medication is the same population that's likely to have underlying dental disease. What do we do with this? How do we safely use these drugs? Well, you know, probably if you have listened to this channel and you've heard me talk about these drugs in the past, I'm not a fan of anti-resorptive drugs as a primary tool. There is a time and a place, absolutely. And a couple of examples of that would be a woman who is in the process of being treated for breast cancer, right? If she has elected to go down the pathway of hormone blocking and she is on an aromatase inhibitor uh, or she's losing bone because of chemotherapy or whatever, she has a defined time frame in which she's going to rapidly be losing bone. Um, and in that time frame, we could use an anti-resorptive drug to prevent that bone loss. This is a very smart use of the, these types of drugs. But the challenge I have with the general recommendations is that these drugs, especially this phosphonates, are recommended as a primary tool for anybody that gets a diagnosis of osteoporosis, regardless of age. And we know that we can't use them indefinitely, and obviously there are risks. So Instead of leaning on a bisphosphonate drug as a primary tool, my recommendation is always to look at what are the a, a causes of your bone loss. Can you reverse those causes? Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. And then are there natural tools that you can use to help to rebuild your muscle, rebuild your bone? And the answer is usually yes. So for our patients that are coming in that are deciding, hey, am I going to take a bisphosphonate or go on prolia or am I going to choose a natural approach? We almost always are successful in a natural approach, but not always, but most times. And the reason why we don't do the natural approach and the bisphosphonates at the same time is that because we're measuring bone turnover markers, we see what's happening with these drugs with bone metabolism. And remember that bone is always breaking down. It's always building up. What we want to do is build up more than we're breaking down. That's how we reverse osteoporosis. If you're on a bisphosphonate drug or if you're on prolia, you are squashing your bone metabolism. You're literally poisoning the osteoclast, or in the case of prolia, you're preventing them from actually becoming osteoclast in the first place from their stem cells. So if you're on these anti-resorptive drugs, it is very difficult to actually build bone. Yes, your bone density will go up, but we know that your osteoblasts aren't doing much. If we have very suppressed bone metabolism, it makes it really hard to reverse osteoporosis. So Yes, there's a time and a place, but if our goal is to reverse osteoporosis, build bone, build muscle, we don't want to squash bone metabolism. And this is just one of the mistakes that we see people make, leaning on the pharmaceutical industry when they haven't looked at what the underlying cause of their bone loss is. If you're interested in learning about some other common mistakes, consider joining our masterclass. We have watched thousands of people now go through this bone health journey, and we have seen the same mistakes over and over again. If you want to learn from us, learn what these mistakes are, and if you are actually making them, please click on the link in the description, join our masterclass. It's absolutely free, and it's my pleasure to bring that to you.
And I'll make one more plug here for a natural approach to improving your bone health. What we've been able to see in our practice over the last several years is that when people are focusing on improving bone health, what actually happens is that health span, how they feel, their energy, all the things that come along with aging and longevity, all of them start to improve. So really what we're doing is through the lens of bone health, but we're creating a path that helps us age with strength and with grace. And that's what I mean when I say bone health is a biomarker of aging. It's not just about your bone mineral density, your T-score. It's about the structural integrity of your entire body. It's a reflection of how you're aging and how you'll be able to remain active and strong and independent over time. So what do we do about this? Well, we need to start by telling the truth. Medication-related osteonecrosis of the jaw isn't just a theoretical risk. It's not vanishingly rare. For some patients, especially those on high-dose regimens or with other risk factors like steroids, poor oral health, or invasive dental work, it's a significant concern. That means dental clearance before starting treatment, honest conversations about the pros and the cons of every therapy that you're considering, especially bisphosphonate therapy, and reconsider the idea of indefinite drugs when safer strategies might be available. Once again, we're reminded that osteoporosis care, like so many areas of medicine, isn't a one-size-fits-all approach. It's individualized, and we need to match the treatment, not just to the disease, but to the patient's entire context. Bone risk, dental health, cancer status, and more. So if this kind of nuanced evidence-based content is helping you rethink bone health and longevity, please do me a favor, hit the like button and subscribe to this channel. Please drop a comment below. I'd love to hear your experience, how the decision around bone health drugs has impacted you and how you're doing on them or off of them. And of course, I always love to hear success stories. That's it for today. Remember that a diagnosis of osteoporosis isn't the end, but deciding to reverse it is a beginning. I'll see you in the next video.